Welcome back. This week, Blair Miller of the DenverChannel.com sat down with Republican State Senator Chris Holbert, the soon-to-be Senate Minority Leader, to see how this changing dynamics of an all-democratic state capital will change the legislative process in Colorado come January. I guess first of all, you know, I guess let's just talk about a little bit about, you know, what that's like for you, uh, for your party transitioning from being the majority in the Senate to now being the minority again. For the past four years, we've had a split legislature with Republican majority control in the Senate, Democrat majority control in the House. And that has, under our state constitution, allowed for the majority of bills to pass and with bipartisan support. Um, the budget, for instance, in Colorado, our state constitution requires that we pass a budget every year and that it must be balanced. And with three Republicans and three Democrats on the budget committee, joint budget committee, it takes four of them to agree or more to do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so the past four years have been actually very productive. People may think it's been a gridlock and nothing got done, but uh, we actually uh, uh, a few years ago had 62% of all the bills passed with bipartisan support. And that year the governor vetoed two bills. Now we start a two-year period where the Democrats control the House, Senate, and the governor's office. We will still see bipartisan support for things like the budget. The Joint Budget Committee has to still work together to do that. And we'll still have a balanced budget, and it will pass. It has to. What we'll probably see less of uh, are, are just bills that change policy that have bipartisan sponsorship uh, and or bipartisan votes on the floor. The fact is, mathematically, all the Democrats need is a simple majority in the House or more, and they have that. A simple majority or more in the Senate, and they have that in the governor's office. And frankly, they can pass any bill that they want to, and Republicans don't need to vote for it. We don't even need to show up. Um, and we will. <laughs> right, and so how does that, you know, factor into policy making on your side of things? And I guess for Democrats as well, you know, I mean, sure. you don't want to have necessarily just a one-sided bill passing for the entire legislature period, you know. So what, what can you do as minority leader, and you've worked with Democrats, yes. you know, in the past for a long time, but what can you do to make sure that you guys are getting stuff done that's not just a one-sided thing? Well, I like to remind my constituents that I have one of the most conservative voting records in the state Senate, and when I was in the House, I had that in the state House. My voting record, the representation that I afford the, uh, the constituents who live in Senate District 30 in Douglas County is different than my leadership role of trying to bring people together. And I like to remind people or explain that bills are words and numbers on paper. And if we're disagreeing on numbers, if you're at 100 somethings and I'm at 50 somethings, 75 something seems like a pretty easy place for us to, to land. But when we deal in the medium of words, bills have dozens or hundreds or thousands of words in them. And if we generally agree that this is the problem we're trying to solve and this bill is generally how we want to solve it, then what word or words do you disagree with? Is it just a few words? Do we recraft those? Take out a sentence, a paragraph? How do we have to restructure this bill so that you and I uh, uh, can agree, or you know, other legislators and I can agree? And I, I, I approach that with uh, with a degree of fascination and experience. That's something that new legislators don't know just because they haven't done it. But I think leadership on both sides, uh, we take time to try to explain that to the new legislators. Don't be offended if someone disagrees with you. We're not just allowed to disagree. We're really supposed to go there and disagree. The communities that I represent see the world, the people who live there see the world differently than people who live in another community. And that's not just a a allowed, that's really what our legislative representation, uh, representational government is about. So don't be offended if you disagree uh, and don't be afraid to have those conversations. And so, you know, one of those disagreements you guys did have last session was on this red flag bill mm -hmm. that, um, you know, Alec Garnett brought up in uh, Cole Wist. So now with Democrats in control of both chambers, they've said they're going to bring it up again. Yes. Last year, Republicans had due process concerns about the bill mm -hmm. was the biggest thing that we heard about. Um, if that comes up again in similar fashion as it did last year, what would you like to see different in this year's bill if you want it to pass? I. I don't think there's a way that I would support that personally, but the debate 
that we'll hear this year on the floor that, that uh, did not happen last session. I think we'll, we'll focus on people who say they want to protect uh, family members, loved ones, people uh, when, when a family member seems to be demonstrating abnormal uh, uh, behavior, they, they'd like to see government step in and intervene and take their weapons away. I'd like to ask the question a slightly different way. Do you want to empower government to take away your property if there isn't reason to charge you with a crime? And I think people start to, th to question that. Well, gosh, if, if I'm out on the roadway, would I want to give government that power? Many people, I think, would say no. What if, if government shows up at your door unexpectedly and say, we don't have enough to charge you with a crime, but we, do, we are going to take your property away because someone said something about you? Um, this goes right into the Fourth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. You and I are protected as individuals, as law-abiding citizens in this culture, in this society, in this nation, from uh, illegal, unnecessary se uh, search and seizure. Mm -hmm. That's what the Fourth Amendment is about. And there really isn't a way around that, in my opinion. I'm open, I'm willing to, to listen, um, but uh, I, I just I don't see a way to get there. I do believe that the bill will pass, but it will likely pass with very little Republicans support. So what can you do to affect that bill while it's going on or do you expect Democrats to just shove it through however they want it? Well I'm not here to point fingers. Uh, they are in control of both chambers. The governor, uh, governor-elect uh, has has voiced a, a support for that bill. So again I, th I think it will become law. I do encourage people who are frustrated that bills might pass that they don't like uh, to understand that under our state constitution, the minority does not have a way to shut down the process. We've heard stories out of Texas and Wisconsin where the minority party, at least we were told, they had the ability to shut down the process and refuse to vote and, and draw compromise that way. Under our constitution, when one party controls both chambers and the governor's office, the minority party does not have that opportunity. If I don't show up, if my caucus doesn't show up, we're either excused or absent. And if, if we just don't show up, we're probably absent. And I think my colleagues and I would rather be there. I know I would rather be there to voice my, my opposition to a bill and be recorded as a no if that's the position that I hold. And so going away from opposition stuff, what stuff that Senate Republicans, even House Republicans, but since you're Senate, um, what stuff that you guys really want to make sure you're working on? I know we have you know more transportation stuff coming up this mm -hmm. year with the ballot measure, but uh, is there anything that you're really keen in on? I think transportation is a great example of where we had bipartisan support in the past. Last year, Senate Bill 1 passed with 35-0 vote uh, in the Senate. Not just bipartisan support, but unanimous support. And one of the things that that did is it put another bonding question in statute for next year. But I also have heard uh, from the governor-elect in, in the majority caucus that they intend to take that out of statute. I would be very disappointed to see that happen. But if 109 and 110 pa uh, 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 failed, excuse me, the, the voters uh, voted those down. Mm -hmm. If that means that voters don't want to discuss a sales tax increase, which I agree, I don't want a sales tax increase, and they're not interested in bonding, uh, which I did support, I think the only solution that we have left is, and I have heard this from constituents, people on both sides of the aisle, that they're not interested in paying the government more money until the government is better accountable for the money that they're already paying. And that means that we need to use general fund dollars to fund roads and bridges. Last year we had $1.3 billion more money than we had uh, projected, and this year I hear projections of another billion more than we projected last year. If we have that extra revenue, I think the people of Colorado deserve better out of our General Assembly and our, our next governor. Uh, Republicans will be seeking ways to better fund schools and better fund roads and bridges with the dollars that the taxpayers are already paying us. Well, Senate Majority Leader Chris Holbert, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank yeah. you.